All right, very good. Good morning, everybody. I guess good afternoon. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Kuhn and I are excited to be here today to talk to you all about sewage surveillance. And I will share our slides. And um, um, uh, uh, my name is Jason Vogel. I'm a professor in civil engineering and environmental science and the director of the Oklahoma Water Survey. And Dr. Kuhn, would you like to introduce yourself? My name is Katrine Kuhn. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist um, at the Hudson College of Public Health. And uh, can you guys see, see the slide screen right now? I can't see the chat, so. Katrine, can you see that? I can see the slide, so should be Excellent. fine. Excellent, thank you very much. So um, uh, yeah, we're, as I mentioned, we're excited to, to talk to y'all about this project um, that really began back in the summer of 2020 um, as COVID-19 um, was uh, sweeping Oklahoma and sweeping the country. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Brad Stevenson, who's one of our team members, um, got a seed grant from the VPRP office um, to look at this on the OU campus. and. Um, uh, you will see all of the things that this has grown into since that time, and it continues to expand. Um, and so we're really excited about the potential of utilizing sewage for um, tracking infectious disease um, um, and other things um, uh, for public health influence. So here's our team. Um, in addition to Dr. Kuhn and I, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Stevenson, um, who um, uh, used to be an associate professor in the in the microbiology department at OU has recently uh, moved to Northwestern University as a research professor. Um, and Hallie Reeves, um, who is at OU Health um, and is a clinical faculty in health administration and public policy. Those were the original four of our, of our team. And you can see us here um, sampling over by the dorms over in front of the, uh, over in front of uh, the stadium. But since then our team has expanded as we continue to do more and more things, including uh, um, Bryce Lowry from um, Regional and City Planning here at OU, uh, Keith Stravette from Civil Engineering and Environmental Science, Madison Swain, who's uh, also an urban planner at San Diego State University and collaborates with Dr. Lowry a lot, um, Graham Wiley, who's the manager of the sequencing core facility at Oklahoma Med Medical Research Foundation, uh, Cara De Leon from uh, microbiology, and also Ralph Tanner from here um, at OU in microbiology. And so our team has um, expanded to um, really fit um, all the different expertise sets that is really needed to do this um, in an in a impactful way. So we're a multidisciplinary team, and we've really um, had the pleasure and the opportunity to work with municipality and public health partners across the state so that, that what we're doing is impactful. And uh, along with that, you will see we're working at multiple scales from a facility up to a whole community and now statewide um, uh, with this technology. Um, but as I mentioned, the, the real important part of this is it's cross-disciplinary uh, with engineering, microbiology, public health, epidemiology, um, community outreach and city planning, um, all contributing um, to um, the final product um, that we're coming out with um, and uh, uh, are also working through the Rockefeller Foundation uh, with um, partners across the nation and through the Rockefeller Foundation and, and Dr. Kuhn and others um, uh, connections ac across, across the, uh, the world. And, uh, and so have so the international part of it is continuing to grow and something that we're looking to expand into even further. So let's talk about sewage surveillance and what are the basics of monitoring sewage um, for infectious diseases. Um, the practice of this, um, although most probably haven't heard of it um, before COVID-19 actually began in the 40s with polio, um, Israel began monitoring wastewater for polio um, on a widespread basis in 1989. And in fact, in 2013, they were able to mitigate a potential outbreak of polio because of the detections that they had um, in the wastewater. In addition, um, it's also been utilized to monitor illicit drugs. And, and um, here's one paper, one of the initial ones where they utilized this for looking at um, uh, the, the prevalence of, of drug use on a population level. 
um, and uh, has been utilized um, for, for uh, resource allocation um, to where the need is the greatest. And, and it's really great because it's unbiased in that way. Um, so SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, is shed from the body in a number of different ways. And, and right up here, RNAs um, are basically the number of viruses that are shed. Um, or uh, so in the nasal, nasal pharynx and in the throat, you can see there are 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 8th RNAs per swab. Um, in the stool or the feces is what we're looking at. Um, 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 8th viruses per gram of feces and also in the sputum at a pretty high level. So this is a pretty wide range, but on the population level, um, it is consistent enough to allow us to get good relationships between case numbers um, and what is shed per person. So one basic question we get a lot is, can you catch COVID-19 from wastewater? And the answer to that is never 100% no, but it's extremely unlikely. There's never been a documented case of um, somebody catching COVID-19 um, from wastewater. Um, we're looking at the genomic fragments of, of the SARS-CoV-2, um, and, and so we're able to correlate that to cases, um, but it's generally not viable um, within the media, that medium that is wastewater, and high temperature, different pHs, sunlight, um, there's lots of different things that can um, make this virus not viable or infectious. But we are working with wastewater, so there are a lot of other things that are um, potentially in wastewater that are infectious um, that still require you to wear the proper PE and take all the proper precautions when you're working with, with the wastewater. So what are the benefits of utilizing this? First off, it's timely. Um, uh, when somebody catches COVID-19, as soon as they catch it, they start to shed um, uh, maybe even a couple of three days before they start to to show their symptoms. Um, and so we're able to detect that um, right away. So it's timely and we analyze it and we can get the results out in about a day and a half. Um, uh, it's geographically and functionally representative. So we know the exact area that we're collecting from. And so we're, we're getting a sample uh, from everybody in that drainage area that's going to the bathroom. Um, and so it's very representative of, of that specific population it's unbiased by individual testing. So everybody goes to the bathroom. And so um, everybody is represented. It's not required. It's not, it's not based upon how many people actually go in and then get tested. And then those tests are reported up through the chain. Um, and then finally, um, in general, it cannot be isolated to an individual. Um, and so that can be a pro and a con, but in general, uh, uh, we see it as a benefit because it's, it's a population level estimate. We're not saying this person has it and this person doesn't um, uh, for the most part. So, so, so those are all the benefits of sewage surveillance and what we're doing. So what happens during this process? First, um, um, somebody um, uh, gets the virus, they metabolize it and excrete it as we've discussed. It's discharged into um, a toilet when somebody goes to the bathroom and it's found in the sewage out in the system. So from there, we utilize um, auto samplers and we collect the sample um, and it's analyzed in the lab here at OU. Um, we we uh, ship that data over to Dr. Kuhn's group and they do correlations and predictions based upon the wastewater data that we have and past data. From there, we also do sequencing um, on a subset of the samples. And so we're able to look at, at variants and, um, and, uh, and see what's happening with the different variants that are there. Then the sample is archived and, and then there's a public health response. And this all happens within a couple of days. And it's really vital that that happens within a couple of days because the real benefit of this is the, is the lead time that we have. And, and Dr. Kuhn will talk about the lead times um, of our predictions um, in a little bit. So also monitoring is scalable. So we can look at an entire um, community or a drainage area that's drained by a wastewater treatment plant facility. And we're monitoring treatment plants that vary from 5,000 to 450,000 people. Um, that little map there is Oklahoma City and that big blue area is about, is over 440,000 people that are 
um, within that area. We also can do neighborhood scale or sub sewer sheds. So we're monitoring that out at manholes. Um, and uh, um, all of those neighborhoods there in Oklahoma, are in Oklahoma City that we're sampling. And they're within that larger blue area that has 440,000 people. And so our neighborhoods could have anywhere from, from uh, uh, um, a couple thousand um, up to uh, 40,000 that we're looking at from a neighborhood standpoint. And then finally, the facility scale. Um, and uh, um, an example of that would be the OQ dormitories and where we're, we sampled um, based upon the sewage system, um, generally we're able to isolate those um, specific facilities uh, and see what's going on uh, from that standpoint. So when we're collecting that sample, as I mentioned, we're going out to the manhole or at the treatment plant um, or at the clean out and uh, collecting samples with a refrigerated auto sampler um, over a 24 hour period. Uh, but there's a number of different ways that we can collect samples. The, the, the easiest way, the least representative way, but a good way to start is grab samples. So we collect samples right at a certain time and place, but it's only representative of the people that are um, going to the bathroom right when that sewage came by. But um, uh, if you select a time when you expect the most people to be active and, and uh, potentially utilizing the restrooms, that, that's, that's a good place to start kind of see what's going on. Um, the next step up is a time-weighted composite. So over a certain period, say 24 hours, you collect it at regular time intervals. Um, that can be very representative um, if the flow doesn't change throughout the day, which generally for sewage it does, it's lower at night than in the daytime. So from the, the gold standard of what we use is a flow-weighted composite, and that's collected every so many gallons. And so that we're representing when more people are um, actively um, contributing to the septic system um, and, uh, and can get something that's representative of the population um, within that area. Um, another um, benefit of that is, uh, um, especially when there's not a lot of activity at night as on, in smaller drainage areas, this sample right here actually represents side-by-side -side samples that, that uh, this sample here was a time-weighted composite. This was a flow-weighted composite for one of the dorms at OU. Um, and at night, there's not a lot of activity. So when we collect that sample, it's actually sucking up more of the biofilm and the scum um, from within there. And it made that sample darker, had some um, more extra older chunks in there, um, as opposed to the flow-weighted composite that you're collecting um, when there's more re representative flow come through. And uh, you can just even see visually that that uh, that can make a difference. And it can make a difference in how easy it is for us to analyze it as well. Um, and then the final way that we're sampling, which is kind of a newer um, technique, but it's been working pretty well, is use utilizing passive samplers. And basically, these are cotton bud tampons, just like the picture shows that we stick inside a 3D printed torpedo that was designed by um, a faculty member down at Monash University in Australia, David McCarthy. Um, and he shared the plans for us with that, that we 3D print these little torpedoes that are designed to um, collect the least amount of of uh, material that's floating through the sewage system um, on the outside, toilet paper and, and the like, um, but still are able to do that. And they're actually showing to be um, pretty representative for a, a lot of the situations. Extreme high flows or extreme low flows are have in general shown to not quite be as good, but in, our, in, in, the, in the typical flows, it's been actually shown to be pretty well, or concentrations, it's pardon, not flows, concentrations. So from there, it goes into the lab and they, they get their sample, they prepare it um, by first concentrating the virus um, with polyethylene glycol or PEG, extracting it and purifying that material and analyzing it with RTQ-PCR um, in the lab. And so um, this happens over a little bit more than a day uh, and, uh, and we're able to get the results out right away and communicate it. And so here's a few of the results um, uh, on the community level. Um, like I mentioned, we're looking at the, at the treatment plants and uh, we have a dashboard that will show the link for this at the end of this. But this is uh, some of the results of our treatment plants um, over the last several months. Um, not quite up to date, but uh, um, through uh, about the end of April, um, the, the, the dashboard is up to date. Um, one interesting thing that y'all may note that we had one of the sites was really high 
um, at this during this period, and we're working for, with a professor named Mark Johnson at the University of Missouri, who's doing some deep dive sequencing, um, and showed that that's potentially what they call a cryptic lineage, um, that uh, that basically is something that probably was in an immunocompromised person for a long time, um, and uh, and uh, adapted over time. Um, and he, his theory is it's actually coming all from one person within that drainage. So neighborhoods, um, as I mentioned, we've been looking at a number of neighborhoods within Oklahoma City and it's been great working with OKC, um, City, City County Health Department, uh, uh, um, 13 different locations, really diverse underserved communities in here and uh, different demographics. Uh, that uh, Dr. Kuhn will talk about that we've utilized for our predictions in the future, but it's helped for them to guide testing and vaccine distribution when they know where the concentrations were high that guided where they went out um, and use that to, for a number of different purposes, including monitoring trends, predicting outbreaks, um, monitoring um, vaccine efficacy and, and genetic variants within different parts of the community. Um, and here's an example of, of the different communities. In general, the trend is the same, but at one specific time, there may be a certain part of the community. Um, and in our dashboard, you can separate this out so it's not quite so much spaghetti if you're interested in a specific neighborhood. Um, so both also on the neighborhoods, we've been working in Tulsa um, on what we call dynamic sites. So they're not as quite a permanent sites on the neighborhood. Um, but we use it for a number of different purposes. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit, so I'll just kind of explain what this is. All of these are going into um, one area, one treatment plant that's called Tulsa North, and these are our neighborhoods that they have lift stations on with specific, um, with specific uh, uh, names on them that are generally after the creek that they're on because the, the sewage systems generally follow, follow the topography. Um, and, uh, and so we monitored the fairgrounds that you'll see the results for in a little bit, which flows into Gold Creek, which flows into um, uh, a, a site called the Interceptor. Flat, Flat Rock also goes into a site called the Interceptor. All of those flow into the Tulsa North Wastewater Treatment Plant. And so there, there's several different things that we've been doing to, with this data, we're not gonna talk about all of them, but comparing neighborhood risk levels to concentrations um, during COVID-19, they developed risk levels based upon um, uh, uh, on detection, on testing rates, um, individual testing rates. Nested sites is another thing that we've looked at, looking at event centers, such as the event center at the fairgrounds as potential super spreader events, and then utilizing the airport as a sentinel site um, is another thing that we've looked at. So first off here um, with uh, um, the, the neighborhood testing rates. So they look at public data based upon zip code and they, they assign risk zones um, that are based upon um, the test positivity rate within that area. And we were curious, does the wastewater back up with what they're looking at on these test zones? Um, and you can see at this one time here last fall, there was a few zip codes that were green, um, uh, lots of yellow and a few orange. Um, um, or maybe corresponding to red if you're thinking about it as a stoplight. Um, and, and, but they also noted that some of these green areas, there wasn't a lot of people getting tested. It was generally underserved areas. Um, and they were kind of curious, how well does this really work for them? Um, uh, here's what, what the three that we looked at when we compared this. One is the Flat Rock Basin, 34% um, below poverty, 69% minority, and 21% Uninsured. This is a um, uh, what you would would call an underserved area. Um, Coal Creek, um, uh, a relatively high percentage, also below poverty, and then Stone Creek. But you will see here. This one was in green. This one was in yellow. This one was in red, um, where there was a lower percentage of uninsured and a lower percentage of below poverty, and uh, more results. Um, or more, more tests was, were being done in this area um, than some of the other ones. Um, so we went and analyzed this for wastewater. Um, and um, as we sort of suspected might happen, um, the areas that were red and yellow um, actually had lower wastewater concentrations than the areas that were in the green. This area in the blue is, the, is Tulsa North, the one that combines all of them together. And we're not collecting all of the neighborhoods that are in that Tulsa North, but um, uh, this, so the, so it didn't necessarily predict 
what was going on with wastewater. We sort of suspected that might be happening, but just this backed us up for that. So um, the other one that I wanted to talk about a little bit was last December over Christmas break when Omicron was coming into Oklahoma. Um, this right here, um, this is the concentrations that's from this side, and this is the percentage of Omicron that we saw in the sample, looking at the treatment plant and then it's the airport as a potential sentinel. Um, and uh, um, here are green is the, is the airport, the brown is the, is, the, is the entire drainage around the airport. Uh, and we have to wait until the technology is out there that we're able to start looking at this. So this was the first sample around December 20th that we were able to look at. Here the airport was greater um, than the neighborhood around it indicating that it's potentially a sentinel site. Um, Christmas Eve, we didn't get an airport sample, um, but from there, it actually tracked the neighborhood. Um, uh, I wish we would have been able to get this sooner, but because um, it's hard to make any, any uh, conclusions based on one data point, but potentially that one data point uh, was indicating that it was showing a leading indicator of people coming into town and, uh, and, and doing that. But um, there's potential if you're looking for a needle in a haystack or trying to look at people moving into the community that would bring stuff over that the airport could be utilized as a sentinel site. So in our facilities, um, here's an example of the data during um, the 2020-2021 year at one of the dorms. Um, and kind of like you would expect here, um, we had a big peak right after Thanksgiving in 2020. We didn't monitor over the break because nobody was here at the dorms. There wasn't a lot of flow going through the pipe. But then in, in January of 2021, um, everybody came back and saw a rapid rise um, up in the peak on, on January 25th. Um, and then it continued to fall up until right before spring break and, and Easter. And then everybody came back from spring break. And what do you know, right after that, um, we saw a peak again. And then it continued to fall off through the summer uh, or through the rest of the school year. And the other sites um, saw the same thing until Delta started to come in. Um, but um, uh, you can really see the trends and, and uh, see what's going on there. And we were able to communicate this with, with OU administration so they could keep a handle of what's going on uh, in different places. So events, um, I had a graduate student, Emily Rhodes, who graduated this spring, and she monitored on an hourly basis at the Norman Wastewater Treatment Plant during OU football games. Um, and because we were curious what those types of events um, look like. And um, here, this, this one right here, and she looked at 2020 and 2021, but this is just one example from Bedlam football in, in, in 2020. Um, uh, and uh, looking at the orange one here, um, for now, don't worry about this one. This is um, PMMOV is something that's a, basically an indicator of sewage. And so that basically shows that it was pretty similar um, throughout, throughout the day with one dip right after midnight. Um, but we saw gen in general a rise. Note this is a log um, scale here in general a rise during all the tailgate time during the game. It went down until um, after the bars, it started to, to go back up again. Um, but uh, kind of like you would expect, but we're tracking from an hourly basis on the community. Along with this, we worked with Dr. Lowry and Dr. Swain to actually look at cell phone data and look at the number of people that were coming into town and out of town. Um, uh, and within her thesis, we actually transferred this into, into copies per person normalizing it by flow and then by population in the community based upon that cell phone data and it turned out pretty cool. So we also looked at the events and this is a kind of a, a, a busy slide, um, but right here is uh, the concentrations uh, in town um, and once again in the Tulsa North and the fairgrounds is within this. And this was just uh, this winter, um, looking at a lot of different things that are coming in there to the event center. Um, you know, this was really the peak of Omicron, but, uh, and then moving through there. And one interesting thing to note here at the, at the fairgrounds where there was a lot of events going on, generally we were below or at the same level at the fairgrounds, um, showing that in general, we weren't seeing, uh, seeing that, that there was more, relatively speaking, more um, COVID at these events where everybody's coming in than there was in the neighborhood around it. Um, except for this first event that was 
once again, right at kind of the peak of Omicron, which is the Chili Bowl, that's a indoor um, car race uh, that uh, it was um, significantly above um, what we saw in the neighborhood around it. So, and then finally statewide, um, and uh, uh, the Data Institute for Societal Challenges provided us some seed funding last fall to look at not just SARS-CoV-2, but some opioids and uh, other illicit drugs, where we went out to, to 41 treatment plants across the state. This right here is a map showing quartiles of concentrations um, uh, that are based upon um, some levels that Dr. Kuhn will talk about in just a little bit, so you can kind of see what. So, so that's kind of all the data that we've been collecting and continue to move to, and now I'll hand it off to Dr. Kuhn, and she can talk about the cool ways that we're utilizing this data. Thank you, Jason. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, a question that we're often asked when we, when we talk about this surveillance that we're doing is, why do you even bother? Because we have to see surveillance that is set up and seems to be working. Um, and my answer is generally, yes, we have disease surveillance. Whether it works or not is, is another question. Um, generally, what you hear about um, when you hear diseases reported is representing this top of this pyramid. Um, can you press the next arrow? Please? So this is um, all of the top pyramid is the cases that are reported that you see um, in any, if you read um, journals, or if you hear about um, things in the news of reported cases. Um, going through this pyramid, each reported case depends on a person becoming ill, seeking care with the doctor, um, the doctor telling the person to deliver a sample, the sample must be analyzed, um, a positive result must be found in the lab, and then the lab has to report that to the health authorities. So in general, uh, for some foodborne diseases, we estimate that for one person um, that has a reported infection, there could be up to one or 2,000 others out there that are infected but never actually have their infection reported. And this is where wastewater surveillance become, uh, comes in because using this type of surveillance, we can actually see the extent um, of the real true um, infection levels and community transmission levels out there and not just rely on people seeking health care and becoming tested. Next slide, please. So um, all the data that you've just heard about that are collected out there in the field, um, we need to find some way of making sense out of them. And this is where my role comes in using epidemiology. So the, the question I really ask myself is how can I use this data to kind of make sense and do public health recommendations? Um, in the first case, um, what I want to do is first of all, well, to see, do we have an early warning with wastewater surveillance? Is there any kind of lead time from that, what we would expect in comparison to normal case reports? And I use um, just a normal correlation coefficient analysis. I'm not going to go into too many nerdy details. If you want, you can always ask me later. Um, after I have discovered that time lag, I then quantify the relationship between wastewater concentrations and cases um, that are reported X day later in the model. And using that model, um, I predict cases um, X day later based on the wastewater concentration that um, I measure today. So if I can just, uh, if you will press the next slide, please, Jason. It's probably easier to show um, using a figure. Here on this figure, you will see um, in the gray bars are the reported numbers of COVID cases. And then in the red and blue lines are the cases numbers that are reported based on the concentrations that we have measured in wastewater. So we had a, a funny, I want to see funny coincidence in that we had some really good correlations uh, with seven days early time. So seven, the time X I was talking about before for Delta um, and what came pre before Delta. We saw there was about a week um, early warning time and then Omicron came and kind of changed the world for everybody, um, including us. And we had to redo the modeling again. And then we discovered that Omicron was a completely different bug because now we have uh, about five days early warning time. This is still, of course, um, still a lot. And it's still um, much better compared to the, the normal case reports that we rely on traditionally. Something interesting you can see from this graph is also that um, if people don't tend to get tested, we don't really have any idea what's going on case-wise because obviously uh, if there are no tests being done, no cases will be reported. And you can see this where I've highlighted with, with the green um, circles here. It's times when maybe there hasn't been so much focus on being tested in the news, so people didn't really feel like they needed to get tested, but we still actually saw using wastewater surveillance that there was um, a high level of community transmission 
um, here in April of last year. Um, then again, sort of after the summer of last year, and now uh, we're in another phase where people are probably not getting tested and reported so much, but we're still seeing what appears to be relatively high levels of, of infections out there. Next slide, please. So um, the dashboards that Dr. Vocal was talking about, um, they show the levels of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater in different locations across Oklahoma. Um, they are public and we'll show the link a little bit later on. What you will see when you visit this dashboard is also um, kind of a risk meter, which shows the number of cases that are associated with each, um, with different concentrations of SARS-CoV-2. So um, this is calculated based on the model that I, I just uh, talked about before, uh, where we just use the model simply to plop in um, a similar concentration across all sites and then calculate the number of predicted cases based on that. We then related those to number of cases um, to the risk levels as they were put out by the CDC at the time. As you can see here, um, before Omicron, we had um, what appeared to be sort of high levels um, pretty early on. So low wastewater concentrations correspond to pretty high risk levels um, with respect to number of cases. But now, yeah, here we go. Uh, a, a few months ago, the CDC changed the, the risk um, level indicators to include hospitalizations and number of beds occupied and so on and so forth. And we felt also that we needed to change our risk assessment. So we did that. And now we actually have, you know, completely different picture. So what we before thought were pretty high concentrations corresponding to a high number of cases has now been shifted it down somewhat. This probably also reflects the fact that Omicron, again, like I said before, is, is a little bit of a different organism than what we did, what dealt with before. Next slide, please. Um, Dr. Vogel mentioned that we do um, both, uh, we, we monitor ge the genetic variants, and this is something for sure that was really important for us um, when Omicron made an appearance. Um, we were actually able to um, monitor the introduction and kind of spread of Omicron across all the different communities that we that we um, we survey. Uh, we use two methods for this. One is the PCR method, which is um, more or less real time. You don't have to wait too long for the results, and it's pretty simple. And then we can take the, step, the, the extra step and confirm those results with um, genomic sequencing, where you get the results a little bit later. And what we saw in the different communities was just a gradual increase of Omicron, which correlated very well with the reports that we also had from human cases. Um, slowly, it was replacing Delta around January uh, of this year. We, we saw a more or less dominance of Omicron um, in most of the areas. However, what was really interesting is that the, the pace, so the speed at which Omicron dominated, was actually different uh, according to some of the demographic um, variables that Dr. Vogel was mentioning also. For instance, we saw that in areas that were more affluent, um, it took a little bit of a longer time for Omicron to dominate, which might be um, in relation to the access of um, personal preventive equipment and, and more, I don't know, focus on hygiene um, and so on. So this is something interesting and pretty new also. We haven't really seen evidence of this um, from other teams. Um, so... Um, Having worked with infectious diseases for 25 years, obviously my, most of my time for the past few years has been occupied fully with um, SARS-CoV-2, but I was really excited when we actually got some money to look for other pathogens in wastewater as well, because um, COVID is not the only one of interest um, when you speak about wastewater. And um, we actually uh, we got a grant from the Presbyterian Health Foundation to look at uh, some foodborne pathogens. And we are one of the first teams in the world to do this on a routine basis. We have been doing this for, for about a year now, and we've actually seen uh, um, some really interesting uh, fluctuations, uh, seasonality uh, with four pathogens that we knew happened, but it's the first time that this has been, has been demonstrated in wastewater. We've also um, assisted with outbreak detections um, and investigations. Um, help, um, we've helped the State Department of Health uh, confirm some outbreaks, what they were caused by, um, because they didn't really have information from human cases, um, uh, from testing of human cases um, in these cases. And I think the next slide is actually showing an example of that. So this was from um, December, 2021. 
where we read a story in the news about a, a school in Tuttle that was closed down um, because of a stomach virus outbreak. And if you work with infectious diseases and you hear about people having upset stomachs um, around Christmas time, it's usually because of norovirus. It's um, it's also called the winter vomiting bug, and it's, it's really bad, and you just you know get very sick. Um, it, it happens often in school settings, uh, care centers where a lot of people are gathered together all at once. And so we actually went out uh, to Tuttle, and we got permission to sample their wastewater in the town, and we did confirm that there was an outbreak of norovirus that was most likely the cause of why the school closed down. Um, this is really cool because it highlights how we can use wastewater to something that wasn't really known. They didn't have any samples from any of the children or anybody else in total. So they didn't know that it was norovirus, but using only wastewater, we were able to confirm that. Um, yes, um, foodborne diseases, COVID are not the only ones of interest out there. Um, we love all sorts of infectious diseases. Another one that's uh, of interest to Oklahoma is West Nile virus. Um, I'm sure you all heard about it. Um, the curious thing about it is that um, when you become infected, you initially will have sort of very diffuse symptoms. You might feel like you have the flu or a cold, you know, just feel a little bit poorly for a couple of weeks. And those people who do not progress to more severe disease are often not diagnosed because they don't seek medical attention until they get really sick. So we assume that there's a really high degree of underreporting for this disease. And for us, um, working with this type of disease is very important to know the true transmission rates out there in communities in order, of course, um, to kind of do uh, public health action where it's needed and also make sure that people are aware that West Nile virus is circulating in the community. Um, antimicrobial resistance, we all know that's one of the biggest threats to public health now and in the future. So that's something that we have on our radar too. Um, Yes, uh, Dr. Vogel has mentioned this briefly, but we've just been um, had a fantastic uh, collaboration with the Oklahoma State Department of Health that have, want to work with us to set up um, a statewide wastewater surveillance network. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, include 30 towns that are kind of distributed all across um, the state of Oklahoma, a little bit like the map you saw before with the, with the opioid monitoring. Um, in these areas, we will do uh, continuous surveillance um, of SARS-CoV-2 to monitor what's happening with the trends and also obviously to, to give public messaging um, to communities, to the public about vaccines and testing and so on. Uh, we'll also be doing a surveillance of the pathogens that I mentioned before, not just to see the trends, but also to assist um, with outbreaks, to identify where outbreaks are likely to happen, where they have happened, um, in order for the public um, to be aware of what's going on. Um, some of the, the next steps that we also want to include in this statewide surveillance um, is to have, when we talk about outbreak, we want to have um, an on-call, on-site uh, network uh, for facilities. And this is particularly um, care homes, maybe schools, um, retirement facilities, where we do see those large outbreaks, in, particularly in relation to norovirus that I talked about before. And apart from the infectious diseases, um, the ones that we currently monitor for are highlighted in bold here. Um, the good thing about this, uh, we're using a PCR, so it's, it's relatively simple to just add a new uh, pathogen to our panel, and we'll be looking at um, other diseases. Um, there I mentioned the, the famous now monkeypox, uh, which is also very much on our radar and should be coming up soon. Um, chemicals, we can look at, um, Dr. Vogel was talking about illicit drugs. We, um, as I mentioned, we can also look at antimicrobial resistance, but even some biomarkers that have relation to seasonal allergies um, or chronic diseases such as high cholesterol, um, all sorts of things, really the sky is the limit. Um, so this slide is just really to sum up um, what we've talked about. And we are excited to work with this type of surveillance because it's cheap. It's simple. It represents the population, uh, but without really people having to go through the hassle of going to the doctor and taking a test. Um, it was really, like Dr. Vogel also mentioned, it was known before COVID, but nobody really ever used it. Um, 
So, but when it exploded, um, when somebody, I honestly don't know who it was, came up with the excellent idea of looking at SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater at the be beginning of the pandemic. And it just took off to unprecedented levels um, where people have used it to not, look at, not just look at trends, but hotspots, uh, target vaccine campaigns, um, you name it. It has been used for everything. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, also for us, it's really important to be able to expand our surveillance so that we include other pathogens also that we know are underreported with the surveillance methods that are traditionally used. And for us, um, the even more big excitement to work uh, with the state on this is that we can we can really help out there with the outbreak investigation and detection, especially in those areas where we know um, the population really don't have proper access um, to healthcare, to testing, um, screening, uh, and so on. So for us, that that's really an important step to be able to help where it really matters. Um, were you going to cover this, or should I do, Jason? No. So, so uh, if you all are interested in tracking this, we have a dashboard, suicidesurveillance.net, um, that has that uh, it's our entire website, and there's a dashboard link, so you can go out there and look at um, uh, at what's going on. And after the slides are done, I'll I'll, I'll pull it up if you all are interested. Uh, we can talk about it a little bit, but uh, um, uh, this is on our wastewater treatment plant level. It's publicly available for our partners. We have um, we also have dashboards for the, our neighborhoods and for um, all of the other pathogens that we're working on and we're continuing to expand um, what we're doing um, on the public outreach side, um, uh, kind of one step at a time um, as far as uh, reaching it out to the public or just working with um, with these with the uh, specific um, uh, partners that we're working with because there is a lot of sensitivity around the data and we want to make sure that what we're releasing is is um, uh, is the best that we can do and when we're doing it in real time we want to be as confident as we can not that we're not confident in the data but it is experimental um, and so uh, but if somebody specifically had some interest um, from a research standpoint or other uh, we'd be happy to to work with specific folks um, on other pathogens or different areas. So with that, um, this is how we always end our, our, uh, our presentations. For those of you that are in any of the drainages that we're sampling, we thank you for, our for your contributions to our research. Um, our contact information is here along with all of our great partners that we're working with um, and it's ever expanding. Um, uh, so with that, uh, we'll open it for questions. So there was a question about whether the dashboard is publicly available, and I, I'm I, I think I mentioned that, but um, um, uh, Catherine, you're seeing the dashboard, right? I'm, I'm not getting a green box around my screen, so I wanna make sure. So this is, this is our dashboard. Um, this is the statewide average along with our um, uh, COVID risk meter. Um, and uh, um, it has a lot of flexibility. This is the last two weeks with bar graphs and a linear. This is all of our data, um, but you can go and look at recent times and see here, over the last couple months, and we've seen a general trend up. This is our Oklahoma City data, our Tulsa data, um, other communities that we continue to, to add. Um, and as I mentioned, we're gonna have 30 um, on this um, within probably the next month or so. Um, you could also go in and look at specific drainage areas. Uh, we have one of these as well for the neighborhoods that is password protected. Um, norovirus um, uh, is something that we mentioned is, is uh, shown, shown a lot of potential um, and see here that recently it's dropped off quite a bit, which we, should, we would expect. Um, uh, Hestec, Campylobacter, we also have um, Salmonella and some other things that we're working on right now. Um, so, but the, the wastewater treatment plant uh, level work uh, is, uh, is out there uh, for SARS-CoV-2 that's publicly available. There's actually uh, a person who's taken to putting our data up there almost as fast as we post it. And um, so it's 
out there on Twitter as well, and a, a lot of folks following it that way. So, so it, it's been very accepted um, from the public. We've had I've had people message me through Twitter that said this is the only data they believe in the state. I don't know if I would go quite that far, but uh, um, uh, it is probably the best data that's out there, I think, for trying to look at levels because it's so unbiased, it's so representative, and it's not dependent on um, individual people um, getting tested. Are there other questions? Okay, if not, um, uh, uh, Dr. Kuhn and I really thank everybody for um, attending today. Um, and uh, 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 as uh, Ben mentioned, this will be out on the, on the web um, shortly um, after a little bit of editing and putting it out there, I think. So Monday or Tuesday of next week. Have a great weekend.